Hello, my friends. Welcome back. On today's show, what happens when an unstoppable force meets an immovable object? We're going to talk about clarity and goal setting. Welcome to the ultimate crowdsource personal finance show. This is Choose FI. You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. Very excited to dive into this week's episode and to help me with this, I have my co-host Brad here with me today. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Jonathan, I'm doing quite well. Yeah, I like this. So this is part two now of our our little series here. Last week we talked more about decluttering, right? In terms of both our physical environment, but a lot of the things in our lives, the people in our lives, the things that we should be saying no to that we probably aren't. And I'm excited to dive into this. I know you have a very philosophical kind of bent towards this part two, and I'm eager to to really chat through it here. Oh, yeah. Thank you for that. And you know, Brad, one of the reasons that I'm excited about this conversation is actually an experience that I had very recently out in the backyard. And throughout the process of digging out this garden bed, I was very motivated to do that. And as I was getting started, I immediately hit a stump, you know, buried in the ground stump. It's just there. And it's just, it's in my way, man. And, and as I start to dig out the dirt around the stump, it's not just a stump, it's the stump. I had forgotten, but this is like at one point, the biggest tree in our backyard. Now it was covered, you know, it was ground down partially, partially, but it's covered with like several inches of topsoil, but it's massive. It is an immovable object. And I started thinking through what are the, what are the implications? Like, should I go get a stump grinder, bring it back out? You know, there's like some sort of minimum cost for getting someone to come out with a stump grinder into your yard. And it just, you know, you could have gone that route, but I was thinking, well, what if I just did it? What if I just got the tools, whatever that might be an an ax or, you know, one of those uh, wedges. And I just took this thing apart. You know, what if I thought about this as an opportunity to explore this concept of the unstoppable force? And we'll we'll come back to this metaphor in a little bit, but what would happen if you, the unstoppable force, were to meet, you know, the stump, which with its four foot plus magnitude is absolutely the epitome of an immovable object? You know, what lessons can be gleaned and what would that do to a person to actually overcome that? And so part of what's going to spark this conversation today is actually a book that I read very recently by Brian Tracy, the name of the book, Goals, How to Get Everything You Want Faster Than You Ever Thought Possible. And, you know, I think on this show, we've had uh, we've had an interesting look in the past on goals versus systems. And while we could certainly go back and relitigate that, one of the things that to me strikes me as the absolute most important aspect of this is clarity, clarity on knowing what we want and why. And I think, you know, on this show, we're choose FI, choose financial independence. It's an intentional choice that we have made. It happens maybe for some people by accident, but for the vast majority of us, it's going to require intentional choices made each and every day to achieve our goal. None of us are overnight success in the making. Rather, it's incremental aggregation of marginal gains, and we get where we're trying to go almost by osmosis. We're pulled along by our community, by the fact that we think about it. We iterate, we iterate our own lives. We look for obstacles and it's saying, saying, oh, it's not possible because of X, Y, Z obstacle. We say, well, what would it look like if I could overcome in spite of that? It's not, ah, man, I can't because it's, I wonder how I could. I wonder Hmm. what it would look like if I could do that. And we do it over and over and over again. And as we achieve this aggregation of marginal gains, we turn into the unstoppable force. Those obstacles, which are immovable for the vast majority of society, start to become fun obstacles that we get to figure out how we are going to overcome, how we are going to circumnavigate it, how we're going to take a step to the right or the left to get where we want to go. Straight and true, like a a homing pigeon, we achieve our goals of reaching financial independence. It doesn't look the same for every one of us, but directionally we're moving towards our goals. I think there's something here for us today, Brad. 
Yeah, I agree. And I mean, I think what you're just talking about is is kind of the ethos of the Phi community, which is thinking about a problem a little bit differently. Like you're saying, the unstoppable force meets the immovable object. And to a lot of people, the immovable object is society's norms, society's expectations, what everybody else does. When you think about it, 95 to 99 plus percent of people, we're all kind of living that same script. You know, there's the expectations, there's the path, right? The high school, the college, the whatever, the get a good job, the work for 50 years. Like you said, get the the watch after 50 years and retire off into the sunset. But that sunset might be at 75 when you're in ill health and when who knows what relationships you've built or lost along the way, right? And I know I'm kind of setting up like a, you know, a, a negative version here and obviously not everybody falls into that. But for a lot of us, again, that immovable object is, this is just what's expected. This is what life is. Are you ever going to be financially secure? Are you ever going to be able to retire? Like all of these what ifs, all of these forces acting on you. And we think you can opt out, you know, and that doesn't mean go live off the grid and do your thing, you know, as a rugged individualist. It means you can opt out of those expectations. You can change the game. You can determine what do you want your life to look like by understanding the rules, by understanding, hey, how can you take advantage of things by saving money like we've talked about? Like it all, for me at least, it all starts from there. Everything else gets easier in life when you start saving money, when you have that financial backbone to fall back on if something goes wrong, that you're not just living paycheck to paycheck. You're not living on the edge of a disaster of insolvency in 30, 60, 90 days If you lost your job, if you were living on that edge, think about the stress you would be under at all times, right, Jonathan? I mean, imagine that life. And that is the life for the vast majority, at least, you know, according to all the stories you read, the vast majority of the American and and world population is you are on that edge. So think about the decisions that you have to make that don't work for you, but work for your employer or work for whomever. Think about what you have to give up and how you have to spend your time when you are living on that edge at all times and think about the stress you're constantly under. You know, there's probably, you know, if we're talking about a mental game here, there's a type of person, a very uh, ascended, I guess is the right word that you could use, type of person that could have no control over any aspect of their life and somehow in spite of all of that was unbelievably happy. The world was tearing them in a million different directions. They can control nothing, no matter what the world threw at them. They were happy in spite, right? And that is all on their level and it is not a level that I've achieved in any way. And I would say for the vast majority of us, our happiness and our unhappiness is directly correlated to our locus of control, (laughs) right? Our ability to, or, or even our internal monologue that says, this is what I believe I have control over. And if that is nothing, then we're stressed. And if it's at a higher level, then we're, you know, for the vast majority of us, we're probably happier. There was a uh, a truth that I stumbled on when I was reading this book that's really just the prompt for everything that we're talking about today. And, And it's one that as soon as I say it, you'll know it's right because it's right. It's just one of those types of things. Here's the phrase. You become and you manifest what you think about the most. You become and you manifest what you think about the most. Now, I think if anybody has listened to like us go back and forth, you know that neither of us is particularly woo-woo, and I am actually almost to the verge of getting a little bit cynical sometimes when I get too close to it. But that statement is true. It manifests in every philosophy book. It manifests in every religious text. It manifests in every self-development book. It's true for reasons that we're going to explore a little bit further, and it becomes obviously true. And it's not woo-woo at all. It's the implications of of what it is. So when you are consumed with external inputs, and we talked about this last week, the alligators and the kittens, the noise, the direness that's going on in various parts of the world, the stress that's coming on social media, the Netflix queue, when you are consumed with that, you've given up your locus of control. You are a product of the amalgamation of all of that potentially anxiety inducing inputs. You become and manifest that. And The results of that are they're confused, they're chaotic, they're not productive, they're not moving in the direction that's moving you forward. Conversely, if you have clarity on what it is that you want, 
what it is that you're trying to achieve. You think about that. You think about how you're going to get there, what information you need to consume to get there. What are the relationships that you need to form in order for that to become a reality? What the obstacles might be and how you can avoid them entirely or how you can overcome them directly. If that consumes the vast majority of your intentional actions, you know, if we talk about that drift state, you know, what your subconscious does versus what you do when you're being actively engaged, you become the unstoppable force. You manifest that. It's almost like a a natural law. Yeah. And this actually, it reminds me of a famous Henry Ford quote, which is whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. And I mean, that ties so closely into the quote that you brought forward a couple of minutes ago. So much is a product of our inner world and how we think about our ability to both impact that world, but our ability to to affect change, our ability to do all of these things, right? Like learn, progress towards something, do hard things. I don't want anybody to walk away thinking like, oh, again, decluttering and saying no. And the goal is just to have this easy life. I don't think to me at least that that is what will bring me eternal happiness. Just like a nice, simple life with no stress and just kicking back every day and and enjoying every second of life. Like, I don't, think that's the goal. I don't want anybody to come away from this with that because I think progressing towards something is critical. Doing hard things makes me feel good about myself. Like when I overcome something, if if everything was just easy and I succeeded at everything, would I actually feel good about myself when I succeeded at something? It's like when you beat the video game and you've got all the power ups and the level ups, the game stopped being fun. Yeah. Like it's just not fun anymore. You know, you're playing Grand Theft Auto and you've got six billion dollars and on the tank to drive down the city streets in. (laughs) The game's not yes, you can blow up the jewelry store. Yes, you can do that. Is the game still fun? (laughs) Yeah. No, it's really not. Right. (laughs) And (laughs) and what's interesting, like that ties into also like where you were going at the beginning of the episode, which is systems versus goals. And again, like you said, we don't want to relitigate this. It, you know, a lot of people set goals and that's very useful. But to me, I would rather set up a system that is not predicated on my happiness or my good feeling about myself is, am I reaching a goal or not? Right. Because then what happens also, frankly, like when you reach that goal, when you get to that point, what happens next? Is there anything still there or was it all just? to reach that goal. And I think you see this with a lot of the psychological literature on even people like Olympic gold medalists. You think that they would be thrilled, but that happiness is fleeting because it was just that one goal. And then it's, what now? Who am I? As opposed to setting up a system of your life that you can work towards, that you can just, I don't even know how to describe it. Like like I'm thinking even in terms of my health, Jonathan. Like I don't have a particular goal of I need to lose five pounds or I want to deadlift 450 pounds. Like that's not it. It's just, I want to be a healthy 95 year old. Like that is what I'm thinking about over the next 50 plus years. And what are the systems that I have to put into place? What are the things that I need to do in order to build that framework of the life? And I I hope, I hope that distinction is somewhat clear because it's not that specific goal because For me, then I worry, am I just going to fall off? Is it what's next when I reach that, you know, that deadlift number or that body fat percentage, you know, if I cared about such things, right? Like it's not that it's, I want to be able to dot, 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 you know, again, pick up my great grandkids when I'm 95 or great, great grandkids or whatever it is. And like, what are the systems I have to put into place into my life in terms of moving, not sitting, getting good sleep, keeping my brain optimized and aware and challenged, like all of these things. And some of those might be long-term, like, okay, I'm not in perfect health right now, Jonathan. Like I'm obviously pretty darn healthy, right? But like my body doesn't work perfectly. All my joints don't work perfectly. I've talked about this on recent episodes where like, I don't want to have limitations when I go to the gym. I don't want to, oh, I don't lift weights over my head because my shoulder hurts. Like that's giving into a limitation. And it, it's so needless. What if I said over the next five or 10 years, I'm going to heal my body. I'm going to be healthy because I want to live a better life. I don't want to live a life that's held back. 
You know, it's interesting. I feel like the word goals, uh, it can be used two different ways. Like I certainly understand the difference between goals and systems. A perfect example here, you were talking about your health a second ago. The two different words that are associated would be diet versus, you know, health. And so it's interesting just when you look at the, uh, I guess it's etymology of those two words <laughs> in the words is actually a clue here, like health versus diet, take all the letters that are ahead of the T, right? So for health, it's heal. And for diet, it's die. <laughs> like on the one end, you're focusing on dying, maybe dying to self. I don't know, putting yourself to some extreme version of deprivation to get to this and then it's over. And the other is you're progressively healing yourself right? You're viewing food as fuel. It's something that you're going to do forever. It's a, you know, you're building the life. There really is a lot there. You know, if I'm guilty of using too many gardening metaphors, diet versus health can give you just as many amazing metaphors <laughs> for goals versus systems, but also for this path to financial independence and frankly, for life, we can extrapolate out. But having said that, I think there's the aspect of looking at goal as a short term thing. And then in that case, it is entirely appropriate to say, in a more holistic way, you would be better served to think about what are the systems that are going to support the outcome that you want. But I think goal can also be used for outcome. Like it can also be used for what is, I need clarity. Like a system is more like steps that we're going to take, but clarity of our vision, clarity of this future that we're trying to work to, you know, we used in last episode, which is the first part of this episode, we were talking about planting this apple tree. And so the systems are all the things that we're going to do but the clarity is I want to sit under the shade. I want to have this life with my family and, and knowing what it is that you actually want, this future you want to design or build directly informs the systems that are, you're going to put in place to get there. So we can have both. We don't need to say goals is a dirty word, or we should only be used this. Really what we're saying here is clarity. What is it that you want? Don't be casual about this. Cause if you pick the wrong goal, like I would like to have a $12 million net worth. Well, okay, are you willing to pay the price to get that? And what are you going to give up to make that happen? It sounds great. Like, you know, Brad, even right now at this stage in our journey, we could make the choice to make more money than we're making, you know, right now, but that would change the inputs, right? So what do you want? Well, is your goal to have as much money? He who has the biggest pot at the end wins <laughs> or the person that reclaims their time, their most precious non-renewable resource to see and do with it as they see fit or as they value to put it back into their priorities, the soonest, you know, <laughs> that is what I want. I want to own my time. And we put a system in place early on to achieve that. Now, once you've gotten there or you're on the path to getting there, you start looking at that equation. Do I want 12 million? Well, sure. You just go back and work 60 hours a week and you know, you'll be on that path and you'll hit that within, you know, a decade versus the Mexican fishermen go off and using our metaphor that already has that. Now they have the exact life that they want. They don't need to escape. They don't need more to have it. They have it. This is why it's so critical when you are in that meeting at 8 a.m. and the boss is getting everybody hyped up about the company's goals and they're looking for people to raise their hands to go do various extra things on the weekend. They're all volunteer activities and you know that there's a checklist with a scorecard of who's going to get the next promotion, who's going to be considered for district manager and who's going to be considered for vice president of operations on the Eastern Seaboard and who's going to be considered. And that's a 40-year vision and you know you have a 10-year timeline. Your goal is different than everyone else's. Your goal is different than everyone else's. Does that change the price you're willing to pay? I think it should. Yeah, I agree, Jonathan. And you used a word in there that I was actually gonna gonna bring up, which is the inputs, right? The clarity is focusing on the inputs, right? It's not about the end game. And like you said, goals, we can use that. It's perfectly fine. Like it doesn't have to be like, oh, it has to be systems. It can't be goals. Like we're saying the same thing. It's about doing the work. It's about getting those inputs right. And this yeah, perfect example, like you just said about the $12 million. If you were just focused on $12 million, you made up this arbitrary number or, or even you know, supposedly calculated or whatever you uh, make yourself feel better about, 12 million bucks is the be all end all goal. Well, what if you got to 10 and a half million? What if you nope, got to 11 nope, and a half? Nope, it's 12. Uh, Susie Orman, it's 12. <laughs> <laughs> right, I mean, then you've set up this artificial construct where an overwhelming success could be construed as a failure. And that makes no sense. As opposed to, okay, the inputs are, I'm going to focus on 
what I value in life. And I'm going to buy those things. And I'm going to ruthlessly cut all the other things that I don't care about, or that the person next door, you know, the keeping up with the Joneses nonsense that people fall into, like, you can opt out of that. You know, that's this phrase that we keep using, you can opt out of that, right? And when you focus on the inputs, especially with your finances, like, it's really simple. If you have a significant savings rate, and I always use 50% as just kind of like my artificial number, but, but I mean, let's be honest, if you have a 30, 40, 50, whatever the number is, like, if you have that, you can't help but be successful financially. You really can't. You could kind of fall backwards into a successful financial life because you've, you've done the hard work up front. You've controlled those inputs. You have this savings rate. And there are going to be things that pop up over the years. There are going to be periods where the stock market is down for two years, five years. Who knows, right? Like you could have a long-term bear market. But if you're putting money in every single paycheck, 24, 26 paychecks a year, and you're dollar cost averaging, you're doing the right thing, you're saving 50%, you are not stressed because you have a net worth. Sure, it's great to have 15, 20% increases in the stock market every year. I'm, I'm not a fool. I'm not saying otherwise. But like you keep doing the right thing and it smooths out those bad times. It smooths out bad luck. You don't have to worry about luck. I think about Jonathan in terms of like poker. Poker is a really great teacher for life. And it's interesting seeing a lot of like the top poker players, like Annie Duke, you know, becoming these almost philosophy teachers. Because when you play poker, and I played at a very, very amateur level, but you know, I, I can play, but you understand because you see, it's almost like that Monte Carlo simulation, right? Like I ran 10,000 simulations and this happened this percent of the time. You realize that sometimes you can have the right inputs. You can have a pair of aces and you can still lose. But that doesn't mean it's the wrong decision to go in with a pair of bases, obviously, depending on the, you know, the particular situation in that hand, right? But pre-flop in a game of Texas Hold'em, if you go in with a pair of aces, you're going to win 90 plus percent of the time. And you're going to lose, like legitimately, you're going to lose a certain percent of the time in that short run. But over the long run, you're not going to stop playing that pair because you lost that one time, right? And it's similar to this. And I, I hope this is making sense, but like luck over short term. You can make good decisions, you can make bad decisions, and you don't know where it's going to fall out. But over a 10, 20, 50 year period, decision making is going to make a massive difference. And thinking about just getting that little bit better, not to be trite, but that 1% better that we're always talking about, like trying to update your thinking, trying to learn new things about the world, trying to come up and understand different mental models of things that you should learn that you can apply to your decision making. Like those are the kind of things that are going to make a humongous difference over a 50 year time period, even if over a short term, something turns out poorly, even with a good decision. So I, hopefully that makes sense. It does. I, I think we need to build on that. So let's use financial independence as you know object lesson for this goal setting. I want to reach financial independence. So that's different than saying I want to reach $12 million. I want to own my time. I want to bring how I spend my time into my locus of control. It's not mine to choose right now at all. Like I have no control over what I do with my time. So we start to bring that back in. We go through uh, you know, a de-noise, declutter, de-stress, and we get clarity in what, what it is we want. I want to reach financial independence. We visualize what we would be doing with that time on the other side. If I had control over my time, this is the life that I want to build. We start to test like to the degree that we're able, how we can start building that life now, You know, that life that we don't need to escape from. And the more that we start to test it and think about it, the more excited we get by what the reality of that vision could be, how compelling it actually is, how much better it is than what our drift state would propel us towards. We manifest this intense desire to start moving towards our goals. We break that final goal and we have to recognize what are the inputs that get us there. We understand the financial independence equation that Brad, you're talking about savings rate, but that ultimately comes down to what you earn minus what you spend is going to produce some amount, right? Hopefully there's a gap. If the output on the other side is zero or negative, you're running a deficit or you're paycheck to paycheck, neither of which are going to get you to financial independence very quickly, if at all, right? So hopefully there's some number that's left over. That's what we have to invest with. And so now 
that energy, that desire that we have to reach this goal, which is financial independence. Now we're starting to look at what are the variables that we can start to have control over? How do I earn more? I don't earn anything right now. I don't earn. That's the biggest problem. I have an earning problem. We solve for that. We go to a community of people that are looking at options to earn more. We look at how to negotiate raises, how to rescale into a different profession that pays two or three or four times what we're making right now. We look at how to start our own business or our side hustle, these types of things. We look at how can we spend less? Look, one of the major strengths that the FI community has as opposed to just generic personal finance is that we are focused on our values. And this is not accurate to the whole populace that consider themselves on the path to five, but I would say it's disproportionately true. We desire less than the average you know, population, even those that kind of consume personal finance content. We tend to be more valuous, not that we don't spend money, but we place a lot of emphasis on purchasing what we value. And that tends to over time mean that we don't spend as much and we optimize our spending. Hey, this is Andrew from the Choose a Fi team. I hope you're enjoying the show. We're going to get right back to it after these quick messages. All right. So we look for strategies and solutions. We get involved in groups. We surround ourselves with people that have, you know, amazing and creative ideas. And all of these are supporting this vision that we've created for what it's going to be on the other side our difference, that gap that's on the other side of that equation, it's starting to increase. And we're looking for creative ways to reinvest that. Maybe ways that actually affect the other inputs. Like I'm going to invest in real estate. Maybe I'm going to do house hacking, which decreases my expenses, actually produces additional income. We learn how to invest in the stock market. We start investing in cryptocurrencies in some cases, all these different ways, but we're immersing ourselves. Our free time that was sucked up in noise and stress and all these other things that we have no control over, all of our free energy, our mental capacity is going towards manifesting this goal. And we're breaking that large goal into smaller goals, pay off the debt, pay off the credit card, pay extra on the mortgage, get rid of PMI insurance, get our first raise, get our second raise, transfer careers, get another degree. We start hitting these small goals because we know these goals are all pointing towards the larger goal. It's not the end goal, it's pointing toward the larger goal. And every time we lock one of those down, we start to become the unstoppable force. We start to feel more assured that the actions we're taking, when we apply ourselves, it's not that obstacles are removed, it's that they become more like annoyances. We step to the right, we step to the left, we overcome and we recognize that identity statement about ourselves, the story we tell ourselves about ourselves, is that we overcome. We are the type of person that. This is what having clarity on the vision of where we want to be, this is what it affords us. Yeah, and that example you use there is is so critical, right? Of like, it all ties together. Like you said, all those little goals. Get rid of PMI, pay off my credit cards, whatever it is. Like a lot of people might not even know what PMI is, right? <laughs> yeah, I said right? that in passing, yeah, <laughs> good call. <laughs> and I mean, they just might be paying this on their mortgage every single month and completely unbeknownst to them that this is not something that they need to be paying or that everybody pays, right? Or there's a way out of it. But until you even have that awareness, and that's where listening to a show like this or learning about, like you said, real estate from bigger pockets or something like that, right? Like just educating yourself, having that fundamental knowledge is critical. It all plays back on itself. As you said, perfectly, like you might learn about house hacking and you might realize, hey, this is something I can do. So you actually learned about it on a podcast or a blog, you implemented it, and then your housing costs, which for most of us is our biggest single expense, now could go down to almost zero or potentially it could be negative, right? If your other roommates are paying more than your rent or mortgage. So you might be in a scenario where now your expenses have been dramatically reduced. And when that happens, again, it all ties together. So because our fine number, because the number we need to reach financial independence is based off of our expenses, when you lower your expenses every single month, you have dramatically reduced the number that you need to hit FI and therefore almost by definition, the time that it will take you to reach FI. So there's this huge positive feedback loop of making these changes. And I think we've used the calculation before, Jonathan, and it's kind of cool that we all just have this in our mind because we realize how important 
seemingly small changes to our finances can make. So for every $100 that you cut out of your life each month, right? So $100 of expenses that you've cut out of your life, that is $30,000 less that you need in your pot of money to reach FI ultimately. Because the simple math is, we always say you take your annual expenses, right? So 100 times 12 is $1,200 a year. And you multiply that by 25 to roughly get you to your fine number. So $1,200 times 25 is $30,000. Mm. So I mean, that is where a critical way of showing you how small changes can make an enormous difference. And I mean, think about a lot of the low-hanging fruit, which is why a lot of us start with cutting expenses when we get into financial independence. As you so appropriately said, there are two sides of the equation, obviously. And many people, certainly in our community, have increased their income dramatically. You know, like you said, reskilling, retooling, salary negotiation, entrepreneurship. You can massively blow up the game by increasing your income. But when you're first getting into this and you cut $300 off of your kind of wasteful food budget every month, that's $90,000 less that you need in your FI number, in that pot of money at the end of the rainbow. Just from that one, those couple little intentional decisions of maybe meal planning or not going out to eat that extra time every week or whatever it may be, right? Those couple of little decisions. And you can do a lot of those things. Like I've seen people without breaking a sweat cut $1,000 off of their monthly budget. And again, without a loss in quality of life, because that's really important. You have to make decisions. There's always going to be some tiny, tiny little sacrifice. But if you can cut $1,000 out of your monthly expenses without a loss of quality of life, that's 300 grand you need less to reach FI. That's a win any way you look at it. You know, it's funny as we're doing these episodes, so many ideas spark and you just want to take a little sidebar for each one of these. Like for instance, with PMI insurance. Uh, so you mentioned that we probably should say what it is, property mortgage insurance. If you haven't paid at least 20% down on your mortgage, then you have to pay an additional insurance to the mortgage company and that just, or you pay a premium to the mortgage company. They take out an insurance just in case you don't, can't fulfill the mortgage. There's an insurance policy that covers it. I don't know about you guys, but my house has appreciated massively this year. This has been a massive appreciation year. And there's a weird little hiccup to this in that you're loan to value. So like if you only put down a two or a 3% down payment or maybe a 0% down payment, but your house has gone up 20 or 30% over the last year or over the last five years, you know, since you got the mortgage, whatever it might be, you might find yourself in the unique situation where you can call your mortgage company and ask them to do, I believe it's, I don't think the word is a recast, but that's what we're talking about. You're just, you're asking them to look at the appraisal and see whether or not the amount that you owe is what well, I'm trying to, you know, the, I think most people can follow me on this, but it's like 80% of the total mortgage value. So if you have a $500,000 house, it's praised at 500,000, your mortgage is for 350, even though you only put, you know, 3% down or whatever. Because of that increase in appreciation, you can have them reevaluate and they could drop the PMI, which could be, Brad, I mean, not an insignificant amount of money. Yeah, it could easily be 100 to $200 a month, I've seen in many cases. So yeah, I mean, that's a cool instance, like you said, and it's kind of hard to give the exact example. But yeah, if a, a house just dramatically increased and appreciated, you can basically, with many mortgage companies, just get a new appraisal. And if you have, I think it's, ever so slightly over 20% equity, I think it's like 22% equity or some such, they can just drop that PMI. Recasting, actually, you mentioned that in passing. I got an email this past week from Becky and she said, and we will have to dive into this more, but a lot of us talk about paying extra principal on our, our mortgage and that might take some time off the backside, but it doesn't change actually what you owe each month. So a 30-year mortgage, if you pay a couple hundred bucks extra a month, might turn into 22 years or whatever it may be. We could run the numbers, obviously. But again, it doesn't change the amount you have to pay that mortgage company in year 12 or year 17. But there's a way to potentially recast, which is it's basically- pushing the, Sorry to interrupt, but it's pushing the term back to the full amount of time. So it's not paid off early, but it's adjusting your payments exactly. down. Exactly. It, it changes the amortization schedule back to as if this were- the principal balance at the inception of the loan. So that is a cool way where, again, if you have paid down a significant amount, you can benefit from that on a month-to-month -month basis. And 
I think there's also some interplay there with with the interest rate. And this is why we obviously, Jonathan, we have to uh, we have to look into this. But if the interest rate has dropped, instead of just refinancing, you could potentially recast. And instead of again just paying this additional principal and getting the benefit 22 years from now, 24 years from now, you can actually benefit from that right now. And and depending on the mortgage company, there are different rules and et cetera. Like you might have to pay a, a lump sum when you recast, et cetera. But that's something cool that again, most people are just wholly unaware that that even exists. And that's what's so beautiful about a community like ours is I get an email from Becky, you bring up recasting just as a one-off. And we're talking about it for a couple of minutes here because there's so many of these things, right? Well, one of the things, the identifiers, we're like 400 episodes in and some people, not, not everybody, but some people have listened to every single episode that we've made since 2017. That is a person that has an intense desire, not for our vision of financial independence, but for their iteration of that. And listening to the show, you know, once a week, twice a week, whatever that is, helps them stay locked in on that goal. And it's just a form of you have the goal. It's important to you for a reason. You know what you want and it's important to you that it stays important. And listening to this show on a weekly basis is a form of encouragement that reminds you of why it was important to you when you started. You know, you had this intense desire that produced the energy to start overcoming the obstacles and now it's self-propelling. The person listening to this is already the care and recognizing that amplifies it even further. And yeah, these are two, you know, we, we talk about this idea of the aggregation of marginal gains. These are a couple, you know, small, but not small things. We said every hundred dollars a month that you can cut in recurring monthly expenses is $30,000 that you don't need to account for in your fine number desiring less not coming from a depri- place of deprivation. You can always spend more on one-offs, but being able to control your recurring monthly expenses is massive. You know, I was talking with a neighbor recently and we were just kind of looking at some of the you know cars in the neighborhood and, and a lot of them are you know nicer upper end cars. And we were just realizing that the payments, and I just realized, cause I don't have car payments. Like everybody in the neighborhood has car payments and they all have two cars. So does that mean that everybody has over a thousand dollars a month in expenses on these car payments? Like, you know, you have to have two cars. And you have car payments at all. I mean, every five years, you have to keep them updated. You always have over a thousand dollars. So if you're spending, you know, a thousand dollar months of car payments, and then you're spending, you know, fifteen hundred to twenty five hundred dollars on your mortgages, and then you're doing PMI that maybe you don't have to on top of it. Like these are all things that we just say, oh well, you got to have a cell phone, you got to have a car payment, you got to have all, you know, maybe you do have to have a cell phone. Do you need to finance your cell phone? Maybe, maybe not. Do you need to always be financing a cell phone payment? You know, these are the types of questions. Question these recurring monthly expenses. Question, do you always need to have a car payment? Is that a rite of passage? Is there another way? There's also some interesting, weird, quirky things that are going on right now. We're talking about car payments again. Again, this buddy of mine that works in the auto industry, he says that right now, the price of acquisition for used cars by major companies that are buying to resell, they're paying on average $8,000 more per car than they were a year ago to get these used cars, to buy your used car, your you know three or four year old, second or third, fourth car, whatever. I can confirm, I went to Carvana. We have like a 2015 like Jeep Compass type thing. And a year or two ago, I got a quote on selling it for like $8,000. It was like, that, if I wanted to resell it, and that would have taken a pretty hefty depreciation hit, they would give me $8,000 for the car. I just went and got a check. Sight unseen Carvana, they offered me right now Seventeen thousand dollars. Oh my goodness! For a 2015 Jeep Compass. If anybody is thinking about offloading their second or third vehicle, you know, because like I just got too much stuff out in the driveway. Now is the time. Wow. <laughs> That's incredible. I've certainly seen that in in terms of. I mean, obviously, there's a shortage, I guess, of these of used cars. I guess people can't buy the new cars. They're trying to get the new five hundred dollar a month yeah. payment with Ford, and Ford doesn't have it, so they're just yeah, they need those down, older. Right? Yeah. I mean, I don't know what's coming. Did you see the Super Bowl? It was like every car was like an electric car on the Super Bowl ads. I don't know if like five years from now, you just can't get gas cars. Like I have no idea, but it's a very interesting time. And that has nothing to do with goal setting (laughs) other than, you know, these unique ideas that if you want it enough, you can start to see opportunities where other people see obstacles. And it's like, how does it support this ultimate goal that we're going for? We also need to take accountability for our mindset when it comes to this. So if you are stuck in a worry loop, you're stuck in a blaming mindset, you're stuck in a justification for why you can't do it mindset, you're stuck in a rationalization for why you can't do it mindset, 
you're stuck in a hypersensitive loop where anytime you get a criticism for somebody that doesn't see the value in your vision, you can't move forward. These are the characteristics that keep someone from being able to manifest this future that maybe the more optimistic person doesn't see. I don't spend time justifying why I can't do something. I don't spend time rationalizing why I can't do something. I don't care that not everybody gets my vision for what I want for my life. And I don't blame anybody for the fact that I took out $168,000 of student loan debt. And then I had to pay that off for a degree that four years later, I'm not using. Those were my choices. They were the best decisions, you know, that I made at the time with the information. There's nobody else's fault, even though, you know, there's clearly like stuff out there that you could justify it. You could rationalize it and you could blame other people for it. Absolutely. But that takes you away from the time you could be spending identifying what it is that you want and how you're going to get there. Because no matter how much time you spend on the other stuff, it's a waste of time. It doesn't get you closer. It makes you maybe feel better as a coping mechanism for why you aren't there, but that's temporary and it's fleeting. It doesn't help you if what you really want is on the other side of those immovable objects. Yeah. And to your point about the, in your case, in your very specific case here with the 168,000, you can point to all of those societal factors that led you to make that decision. But at this point in your life, how would that serve you? Right? I think that's what you're ultimately getting at. How does it serve you to focus on the negative? So many of us focus on the negative. And as you said, your life is a product of what you think about, right? I'm kind of paraphrasing there, but how many people walk around complaining all the time or focusing on the negative? If you actually look around and listen, and I think uh, the book I read, I think it's called A No Complaint World by uh, Will Bowen. I read it years ago and it, it just, it was one of those kind of like seismic shifts in my thinking because once you are attuned to how much complaining and just blaming and sarcasm are, are always going on, you almost can't unsee it. And you realize like 50, 70 plus percent of conversation around you are just like people complaining about things. And it just, I just wonder why that became the default. How does that serve us? If, as you said, your life is that product of what you think about and you're constantly focusing on the negative, how does that help you? How does that make your life better? Why does that make you want to get out of bed every morning so you can go and complain some more and commiserate with people? Like, why? What are we doing here? Again, you can opt out of that, right? When you find these negative people, you can opt out of those relationships. You don't have to spend as much time with them. You can change the subject to something positive and like just keep doing that. Even if the other person doesn't notice it, maybe eventually they will. Maybe they'll realize, hey, this person's a nice person to be around, right? Because even if they're not internalizing why, maybe they just feel better when they're around you, right? And again, we talk about all these like the feedback loops. Maybe people want to be around you more when you're the positive force in their life, even again, if it's not at their conscious level. And I think that's kind of a, another cool thing is like when we're the positive people in others' lives, like they're going to come to us. They're going to want to spend time. Like who would you rather spend time around? Someone who is just endlessly negative or somebody who's doing something cool, something different, somebody who's gardening and planting trees like you, Jonathan, right? Like, and has something fun to talk about these things that I'm learning. Like you can't help but get jazzed up when you're, when you're talking to somebody like that. Right. And I just, I think that's really cool. Again, that, that clarity of what do we want out of our lives? And like, it's not always clear, you know, Jonathan, that's another thing. Like we're not trying, and, and I hope nobody's getting from this that like, you need to pick your clarity for the rest of your life. And like, that's going to be what you focus on, you know, monomaniacally for forever. Like it doesn't work that way. You know, like we're constantly updating our thinking because again, we're open-minded people, right? It's like, how do you conceptualize yourself? I conceptualize myself as someone who learns, somebody who thinks, somebody who sure has strong convictions, but they're loosely held because I know that things change all the time. You know, you look back at history and you think of all the things that, that people were 100% certain was scientific fact or whatever it may be, right? Like just the way that it was. And we look back and kind of chuckle. And Brad, are you saying the science changes? <laughs> yeah, of course it does. That is literally the scientific process, right? And like anybody who gets stuck in their ways, like I just think that is a recipe for failure in life. I really do. All right, my friends, it's so easy to get fixated on obstacles and people are so quick to point out all the reasons that you can't do something and to point out why you probably shouldn't even try. 
And when that inevitably happens, I hope that you'll remember this episode and you'll remember this concept, this thought process for becoming the unstoppable force. They didn't think it was possible. And for them, they were right. For us, for those of us that start to view ourselves as an unstoppable force with the benefit of time, and that's the key, right? We're actually, our goal is to reclaim our time. We're able to recognize that an object is static and a movable object is static. We are a force, but we are a dynamic force, right? A force is a vector. It's direction plus magnitude. We can speed up. We can slow down. We can change our angle, change our direction. We can move just a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right. We can go a little bit more slowly while we tackle these obstacles with a little bit of creativity. Or in aggregate, yes, the object is immovable. That stump was immovable. But what if you recognize that that stump, with the benefit of having a small hand tool like an axe, is rather... A thousand or a hundred thousand chips. You remove the chip, the chip is never going back. And slowly over time, you decrease the integrity of the monolithic stump. And at some point, your success becomes inevitable. And that is a quality that we share with people that are on this journey to financial independence. And I just want to point out as a way of encouragement if you're listening to this show, you know, week after week, it's because you identify with that statement. Maybe as we're going through the concepts and the stories that are presented on this show, maybe you're actually providing advice, right? It's almost like, man, I wish they would hit this because that would be so useful. We'd love to hear your input. We'd love for you to join the conversation. Let me encourage you to uh, join the Fi Weekly. It's a newsletter comes out once a week and Brad shares, you know, community and actions that have been taken by the community each and every week. And he asks you, what's the one thing we'd love to know what it is that you're working on? Brad, how can someone join that newsletter? Yeah, head over to choosefi.com slash subscribe and just put in your your email address and you'll get an email from me every Tuesday morning. And I literally, I personally write this every Monday and I read every single response. So if you have questions, if you have topics for the podcast or whatever it may be, of course, you're the actions you've taken. That's what I love hearing. But please send in those questions, send in those comments, good, bad, or indifferent, right? Like we want to hear this is as Jonathan says at the beginning, right? This is the ultimate crowdsource personal finance show. That is what it has been for now 500 episodes for five years. This is not the Brad and Jonathan show. This is the Choose FI community and we need you. And that really is the easiest way. So choosefi.com slash subscribe. Well, here's to the next five years of unpacking stuff to the nth degree. All right, my friends, the fire is spreading. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled.